like to call your particular attention to the 27th Psalm and verse 10. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. You have probably heard the modern version of this verse, which goes, When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Boy Scouts will take me up. That is the experience of a great many boys, of course, today. But this psalm, out of which this verse is taken, it comes from the experience of David when he was pursued by Saul. This man, for he was a man at this time, he was first a little shepherd boy, and it was at that time that Samuel came and poured the anointing oil upon him. And from that moment, his life was in constant danger. He left the sheepfold, and he came to the palace of Saul. He was only a brief time in that palace. He was forced to flee for his life, and he found himself surrounded by enemies, uh, so much so that he was not able to make contact even with his own family. And actually, this verse does have a better translation, and if you have your Bible and will note the change that we make there. It is not when, but rather for my father and my mother have left me. Then the Lord will take me up. Actually, what David is saying is not a possibility or a probability, but that which had actually happened in his own experience. You see, when he was forced to flee... He knew his own father and mother would be in danger because Saul could take them and he could bring David to surrender by attempting to uh, persecute them or attempting to use them as a hostage. So David took his father and mother and removed them from the land. You find in 1 Samuel, the 22nd chapter, verses 3 and 4, this language. And David went thence to Mizpah of Moab, and he said unto the king of Moab, Let my father and my mother, I pray thee, come forth and be with you till I know what God will do for me. And he brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt with him all the while that David was in the hole. Now David, you see, took his parents, and he left them with the king of Moab. And while David was forced to flee from Saul, they abode there. But we never hear of his parents again. We have no further word concerning them. We do not know, actually, what happened to them. Did they die at that time? Well, we do not know. We do know this, however, that David was an orphan by circumstances, that circumstances forced him as a young man to get separate from his parents, and as far as the record is concerned, he never again was with them. And actually, I'd like to read to you the Amplified Version because, again, it's quite helpful at this particular juncture. Let me read. Although my father and my mother have forsaken me, yet the Lord will take me up and adopt me as his child. May I say that that is indeed, I think, very good. Now, this man, under those circumstances, when he could no longer go home and get the counsel of his mother and his father, 
He could no longer go home for home cooking. He could no longer spend time with his parents. This man found himself absolutely in the position of one who'd been forsaken by his father and his mother. And David tells us that at this particular time that God became for him both father and mother. Now, when I make that statement, I want to hasten to say this. We need to have our thinking clear at this particular point because as far as the Word of God is concerned, there is no female principle in deity. You do not find that in the Word of God at all. That's found in paganism, and it's found in idolatry, and in the heathen religions of the world. But you never find that in the Word of God. So that God is always depicted on the pages of Scripture as a Father. He's essentially that. He is God the Father. But there is ascribed to Him the affection and the care of a mother. And that's the reason that I use the expression a great deal, the mother love of the Father God. And I think that if you let me resort to grammar for just a moment, it's the difference between a metaphor and a simile. Do you remember when you studied that in school, the difficulty you had of being able to tell the difference between a metaphor and a simile? And someone said, what is a metaphor? And they said, a metaphor is to put a cow in. Well, that's not really the purpose of a metaphor. Will you note the distinction here? God is presented in Scripture as a father. That's a metaphor. But God's tender affection is like that of a mother. That's a simile. And you find the Word of God speaking just like that. Listen to Isaiah in the 66th chapter, verse 13. As one whom his mother comforteth, so will I comfort you, and ye shall be comforted in Jerusalem. The thing that God said to the nation Israel is, just as a mother comforts her little one, that's the way I'll comfort you. And then the Lord Jesus adopted that. You will recall that when he sat over Jerusalem and wept over that city, he made this statement in Luke the 13th chapter, verse 34, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, but ye would not. The Lord Jesus himself said to Jerusalem and to his people, he said, there has been many times in your history when I, as God, I would have gathered you just like a mother hen gathers her little ones, but you would not. Now, some of you folk were raised in the country, I'm sure. You look like you were raised in the country. That is, some of you do. I was raised in the country, and I'm not ashamed of that at all. But how many of you have seen an old mother hen in the spring of the year that just started out with her little brood of chickens, maybe have a dozen or 15 little chickens, and she goes clucking along, and then the hawk, flies overhead. Have you ever seen what she does? I don't know what she says to those little chickens. They don't seem to have very much sense, but she says something to them, and they all come running and get under her wings, and she just hovers right down over them to protect them. Our Lord had that in mind when he said to Jerusalem, I would have sheltered you from judgment if you just only come up and under my wings. 
And my friend, may I say to you, that's what God is saying today to the sinner. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ, when he stretched out his arms and said to children, and he said to sinners, he said to everyone, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll rest you. Get under my wings. I'll shelter you from the judgment. In fact, he bore that judgment for us upon the cross that you and I might be sheltered just like a mother hen shelters her little brood from the danger from without. Now that is the picture. God is a father. He combines all the attributes of father and mother. Now, listen for just a moment. If God in his providential dealings has given you a wonderful father and the love of a Christian mother, he's given you something of himself. Yes, he has. If you have known what it is to have a wonderful father, one that you could go to as a boy or as a girl, when God gave you that kind of a father, he was giving you something of himself. If God gave you a godly Christian mother that you remember opening the Bible, a well-worn Bible, and getting down and praying with you, God gave to you something of himself. Because all that is good in a father and a mother comes from God. That's the thing that he's trying to say to us here. Now, if you this morning are a father or a mother today, may I say to you, you can know how God feels. Do you remember the first time that you looked down into the cradle and saw your firstborn? Wasn't that a thrill? You know, that to you was the most wonderful, precious thing in the world, wasn't it? As a friend of mine used to say, he said, you know, it's interesting. He says, uh, Father or mother may have a little one, may have a head like a ten-cent watermelon, but they think it's the most beautiful thing in the world. My, you look down at that little one. My friend, when you did that, you know exactly how God feels when he looks at you today. You know exactly how God feels toward you today. Do you remember as you looked at that little one? You were willing to give your life for that little one, weren't you? In fact, that's the thing that you said within your heart of hearts. You said, I'm willing to die for that little one. God did die for you. That's the way he feels toward you. Therefore, God has given fathers and mothers so that they can know something about God today. Now let's go this morning to Psalm 27 and see something of the deep feelings and the high emotions that swept across the soul of David as an expert organist plays on the keyboard of an organ. David had a great capacity for God. Preacher said to me last night down in in Palm Springs, he said, you know, it's difficult today to find people that have a capacity for God. It's true. That have a real hunger and longing for God and the things of God. Now, David was filled with an intensity and a passion for God that honestly to us seems sort of embarrassing today. The joy just welled up in that man's heart and he was actually on fire for God. 
And this man was in the midst of dreary, doleful, dreadful, and dark circumstances. And he was hunted like a wild animal. There was danger at every noise in the forest and every turn in the pathway. He did not know. He was under constant tension. 24 hours a day, he didn't know when any moment that his enemy would come upon him. And you know men crack up under circumstances like that. And in the midst of all of that, he bursts into a confident prayer and praise to God. This is this man, David. And he can say, as the heart panneth after the water brook, so panneth my soul after the O God. Now this psalm, the mechanics of it, goes something like this. In the first six verses, you have triumphant praise in the presence of pressing problems. And from verse 7 on through the psalm, verse 14, you have thankful prayer in the pressure of painful predictions. Now let's notice that. First of all, there is triumphant praise in the presence of pressing problems. Notice verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Now, God is three things here according to David. He says God is light, God is salvation, and God is strength. Will you notice those? Because they're very important, and it helps us to know God. God, first of all, is light. In fact, that's the definition, at least one of the definitions given of God in 1 John. God is, first of all, light, John says. God is love, and God is life. Those are the three things that are the definition of God. And God is light. And did you know that light is still a great mystery to man? I have here a clipping. The title of it is Amazing Laser. The miracle ray is coming of age. This was in the U.S. News and World Report. Light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. I don't know what that is, but that's what Dr. Town, Charles Town out at Caltech says, and I guess he knows what he's talking about. He speaks of these laser rays. You probably heard of them. They are powerful rays of light that are brighter than the sun, and they are shot out of a device today that's no larger than a flashlight containing a ruby rod. Now, Laser has already been used to illuminate the moon. Did you know that they can, they can put that laser light from this earth out yonder to the moon and light up the moon? It's brighter than the sun. Did you know that they've already used it to weld metal and it performs knifeless surgery? And right now, there are 500 U.S. firms that are connected with this mushrooming race to put light rays to work. May I say to you, this will, they think, will be the next great breakthrough as far as science is concerned. Man this morning knows practically nothing about light. And yet he knows a little something. He now has a little flashlight that performs wonders. Laser light. God is light. That's the first thing that he ever said. As far as the Word of God is concerned, let there be light. And there was light. 
what kind of light? The sun and moon didn't come on the scene until the fourth day. Well, they know there's cosmic light, and there's probably a great deal more that we know nothing about today out yonder in space, light that man knows nothing about. God is light. Now, David brings this down, and he says, God's my light. And then he says, God is my salvation. And will you notice when he said, God is my salvation, that he didn't say, God furnishes me salvation, or even that God provides me salvation, but God is salvation. David had no notion that To be saved, to have God's salvation meant to go through some system, join some church, or promise some thing. To David, salvation was God. And my friend, that's still true this morning. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of of God hath not life. 1 John 5, 12. And it's just as simple as that. You want to know today whether you're a Christian or not? Well, you can answer it in five seconds. It's not whether you belong to a church. Many are convinced now that America's filled with church members that are not saved. That's the reason many of us are counting on the Billy Graham crusade that's coming. We believe that literally thousands of church members that are in many of our churches in Southern California are going to get saved. And they are the hardest people in the world to reach today because they think they've got something. My friend, this morning you can know whether you're a Christian or not, not by your church membership, not even by your life. The thing that you can know this morning is is whether you have Christ or not. You either have him or you don't have him. You are either trusting him this morning as your Savior or you are not trusting him this morning. There's no such thing as middle ground. Christ is either your Savior or he's not your Savior. David said, the Lord is my salvation. The third thing that he said, God is my strength. David recognized his own weakness and inability. If you had said, as a great many people say today, David killed the giant Goliath, he would tell you he did not. He would tell you that I was nothing in the world but a little weak shepherd boy. And God is my strength. Oh, that you and I might learn that today. Friends, there's no strength in you or in me. None whatsoever. During the Grady Wilson crusade, one of the new converts said to me, fine young fellow, he said, I just hope now I'm going to be able to live the Christian life. And I stopped him immediately And I said to him, look, you're sure in for a real disappointment if you expect to get anything out of yourself. I said, you know, I said, I used to think that Vernon McGee was going to do something, but he never has. Never has. There's no strength or power in us at all today to produce anything. David says, the Lord is my strength. Oh, that you and I might learn that. And that's the hard lesson for some We were talking last night down in Palm Springs to the group on this verse. I can do all things in Christ who strengtheneth me. Christ is the one, my friend today alone, that can strengthen us to meet the issues of life, can enable us to live today. You and I cannot live the Christian life. And by the way, God never asks you to live the Christian life. He never asked anybody to. You can't show that to me in the Bible. What he did ask was for the permission of living the life of Christ through you. That's something else. In fact, that's going the opposite direction. It's to permit him to live the Christian life through us today. 
Now, the thing that interests me about this verse is this. When I read it, I emphasized the personal pronoun I and my. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Five times in one verse, David uses the personal pronoun I. It's one thing today to say God is light. It's another thing to say God is my light. It is one thing to say today that God is salvation. It's another thing to say God is my salvation. It is one thing to say that God is strength. It's another thing to say God is my strength. This morning, that little personal pronoun makes all the difference in the world. There are a great many people today that say, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world. The question is, can you say this morning, Jesus is my Savior? Is it personal today? It comes right down to that. Is he your Savior today? That is the thing that he's saying. It's one thing to say God is light, but is he my light? He says, I'm the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. It's another thing to say, God is salvation, God is my salvation. Have you appropriated Christ as your Savior? It's one thing this morning to say, God is strength, I know he's all-powerful, but are you this morning in Christ? I can do all things in Christ, which strengtheneth me. And he says here, all of this, brings him to the place where I shall not fear. What he's saying is this, not that fear will not come into his heart and soul, but God will deliver him in his fear. It's quite normal to be afraid. There's something wrong with any person today that's not afraid. It's a very bad sign today not to be afraid of certain things. I noticed on our freeways today, that there, apparently there are a great many people that are not afraid of the speed of these cars. And you can see what happens. May I say we do well to be afraid today of the speed of the car. We do well today to be afraid of certain things. But he delivers us in our fear. Now will you listen to him? Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear, though war should rise against me. In this will I be confident. It's easy to say God is a help, but have you, like David, found him a help in your life? You see, David was up against the raw realities of life. He was a strip soul, naked before his enemies. And these things that David are saying are not religious clichés. These things have been poured into the test tube of life, and the acids of danger and discipline have been put upon them. And he's found that they were tried in the crucible and the fiery circumstance of suffering, and David found these things to be true. Have you found them to be true? Does this work for you in Los Angeles? And if not, why not? Now will you notice, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after. And I'm not going to probe that farther than just to say this, one thing have I desired of the Lord. The cause today of much of our frustration is that most of us have too many irons in the fire. 
we're trying to do too many things. I find that's my problem. Is that your problem today? We are tempting in this busy, hectic day as Christians to do too many things. That was Martha's problem and not Mary's problem. Now, you see, Mary did what she was supposed to do, and she still had time to sit at Jesus' feet. But we're told that Martha was cumbered with much serving. And the Greek puts it something like this. Martha was like many of us. She was all surrounded by the pots and the pans. And she must get up a dinner for the Lord. He's come to visit. So she goes here and she starts to do this. And she thinks of something else and she starts to do that. And my, this must be done. And while she's doing that, that which is on the stove is burning and she's got to turn and do that. Now she's got to go back and do all of this. She was cumbered with much serving. Isn't that your problem and my problem today? James says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. That's our frustration today. May I say not only did David nail this thing down, one thing have I desired of the Lord. He whittled it down to one point, a fine point, and Paul did too. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. My friend, have you got your life whittled down to one point this morning? Or really are you trying to do about 40 different things today? And that's the thing that causes our frustration today. We're trying to do too many things. Most Christians today are trying to serve God and mammon. I talked with a couple some time ago. They're having great problems. And the great problem is actually can be whittled down to that one thing. They'd like to go with the world, especially one or two nights during the week. Then they would like on Sunday to work for God. You see, that's caused trouble in the family. It's caused trouble with the children. They've lost them. And it's causing trouble in their inner life. Why? Because, my friend, you and I are so built that we have a one-track mind. And God has only called us to do one thing. One thing. One thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I seek after. And he had his life whittled down to this one point. You see, what was the passion of his life? Oh, well, what was it he wanted above all else here? David had the overwhelming and the all-consuming desire for God. That came first for him. That was wonderful. Let me come back to the verse. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. I don't know whether we understand that kind of passion and love today or not that he had for God. That's the reason God called him a man after my own heart. You see, there was a time when he failed, but that was not the bent of his life. That's the one isolated incident. The difference between David and Saul was Saul's life was a continual life of sin away from God, rebellion against God. David only failed one time, and underneath that failure there was a faith that never faltered. He came back to God. He said, I, I want you. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee. And David got this. He was hiding out from Saul, and I suppose one day he was lying in the mouth of the cave, and he heard out yonder in the bushes. He heard a great movement, and he reached for his spear, and his men that were on guard, they became alert immediately to see what was coming, and there broke through the bush 
a deer. And the deer was all lathered down its side. Its little tongue was hanging out. And the hunters were down yonder in the valley beneath. They were chasing that deer, and they'd been chasing it for hours. And the little fellow was just all worn out. He doesn't see David and his men hiding there, and the little fella comes up to the water brook that runs in front of the cave, and the little fella just puts his face right down in that water brook, and he drinks his fill, and he stands there and just heaves. And David looked at that little animal, and he says, As the heart panneth after the water brook, so panneth my soul after thee, O God. Wouldn't it be wonderful today to get your life whittled down to one point, and that one point would be, my life is going to tell for God. You talk about honoring mother. My friend, that would honor mother. And if mother today could whittle her life down to that point of putting God first, in everything. Now, let me move on. Will you notice what David continues to say? For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. God's very practical, you see. Uh, God is something that he incorporated into his daily life. And then he goes on, And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacles sacrifices of joy I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. He gave David a song in the night. Now briefly let me conclude with this thankful prayer. And he fairly sings this prayer. Notice what he says. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. He casts himself now upon God. Glorious abandonment of giving himself completely to God. You see, today, again, we have the problem of always holding back something for ourselves. And again, that causes the problem of not being able to whittle our life down to one point. We say we are going to give God so much of our time, we give him so much of our effort, we'll give him so much, but we've got to have a little for ourselves. It's just wonderful to give yourself total commitment, absolute commitment to God. And David knew what that was. Now will you notice as he moves now in verse 8, when thou said, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. He's reminding God of his promise. He says, Lord, you said to seek your face. My heart, not his head, but my heart, is what responded. I answered from down here, not up here. Had you been in Israel at the time that Malachi the prophet wrote, I don't think you would have understood Malachi. Malachi said, God says to you, you've forsaken me. And God says, away with your sacrifices, I don't want them. And I'm of the opinion that you would have said, I don't understand God. What does he mean that these people have forsaken him? The temple is full every Sunday. People are going to the temple and they're bringing their sacrifices. They're going through the form. My friend, they were going through the form, but their heart was not in it. David says, when you said, Seek ye my face, my heart said, Thy face, O Lord, will I seek. We've got a lot today for the head. Right now, there are a great many people think that intellectually you can appeal to God. We were looking at this last night. Did you know that the Lord Jesus never did appeal to his mind? And he had about the highest IQ. He never appealed to his mind on a judgment on anything. What a lesson for us today. 
He never said, because of my great intellect and my ability and my superior knowledge, I make this decision. He never made a decision like that. He says, I am doing the thing that pleases my Father. I'm totally committed to God. It wasn't appealing to the head, to the heart. My heart said, Thy faith, O Lord, will I seek. Now will you notice, he throws himself utterly and totally upon the mercy of God. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. He commits himself totally, just absolutely abandons himself, throws himself upon the mercy of God. And my friend, God never yet has rejected any sinner that has cast himself upon him for his mercy. Because God's mercy is able to meet the need. It's just that we don't call upon him. It's because we do not cast ourselves upon him. Now will you notice, and we conclude now with the verse where we began. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Or, for my father and my mother have left me, then the Lord hath taken me up. I know nothing about the mother of David. I know next to nothing about his father. I know this, that his father made an awful mistake concerning David. When Samuel came to anoint one of his sons, he had them all parade before Samuel, and finally Samuel said, Don't you have another? And David's father, Jesse, said, Yes, I got a boy hot shunner with his sheep, but he's a little fella. You certainly wouldn't want to make him king. But that was the one God intended to make king. That's all I know about the parents of David. I do know this about them, that they were frail and weak human beings. I know this, that they could never help David. I know that he was an orphan by circumstances, but he found out that God could be both father and mother to him. God made the heart of a mother, and God made the heart of a father. God made the heart of a mother and made her the finest thing that he's ever made so that you could know something about him. But did you know that it's possible for mother love to fail? We're seeing it in our day. Isaiah said, Can a woman forget her suckling child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Listen. Yes, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. We're living in a day of unnatural affection. We're living in a day when mothers even kill their offspring. Where did God said it would come? Can a mother, can a woman forsake her child? Yes, she can. They do today. Thousands of them are being left today. But God says, I'll never forsake you. I'll never forsake you. I close with this testimony. My dad died when I was 14. That's the wrong time for any dad to die, I know that. Just when a boy is at that age when he needs a father. My dad was a heavy drinker, but he was my ideal. I thought he was a great fellow when I was 14. That's the reason I don't understand a great many high school young people today that are rebelling against their parents. Because I thought my dad was great, but he died at the wrong time. I went back and lived with an uncle. He was an old bachelor. What a chance he missed. How many times I would love to have gone and talked to him. 
but I couldn't. And I had no one to go to till one day I was brought to Christ. My friend, it meant so much to me because when I came to him, I got a father and I got a mother when I came to him. Oh, this morning, my friend, it's wonderful to honor a human mother, but they're only human. They're frail, weak. God says, I'll never, I'll never forsake you. You want a father? You want a mother? Come to the Savior. Shall we pray? As our heads are bowed this morning, in this closing moment of this service, I'm wondering if you were here today and maybe lonely in your own heart and life. Maybe you today are frustrated. Maybe you're filled with fear. You know something of your own inadequacy and weakness. You'd like to have someone to turn to. Someone to stand by you. Someone that will be your strength, be your salvation, and be your light. Light to guide you. Salvation to save yourself. And strength to meet the issues of the day. You can only find that in Jesus Christ today. As our heads are bowed, I'd like to give you this opportunity right where you're sitting, say, this morning. Preacher, I have a need, a need of this Savior. Pray for me the best I know how. I'd like to trust him. Are you present today? Do you have that need today? Why not take this step of faith toward him today? He'll meet you. I testify to you today, he'll meet you. He'll be both father and mother. One you can go to with all the burdens and problems of your life. And he will give you life. He will give you salvation. He will give you strength.